the first speaker who's going to speak about my way is a young man that's really special to me. He is Alexander Piostikov, MD, PhD. He is a staff physician at the Diamond Headache Clinic, specializing in pain medicine. He is board certified in internal medicine. He received his MD and doctorate with honors at the Moscow Medical Academy in Russia. It was there he completed his postgraduate professional education in neurology. In November, 201, Dr. Fiostikov traveled to Chicago to start a fellowship in headache medicine at the Diamond Headache Clinic. He was awarded a presidential award. I believe it's the Yeltsin Award, wasn't it? Putin's Award, okay, <laughs> from Russia and was able to select his chosen course of study in its location. I and the clinic were deeply honored that he chose our clinic to do his work in. After completing his fellowship, he remained at the Diamond Headache Clinic as a research fellow and served as an abstract editor of the journal Headache and Pain. After electing to remain in the United States, Alex completed a residency in internal medicine at St. Joseph Hospital and a fellowship in pain management at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation. Alex lives in Glenview with his wife, also a doctor, Alina, and his two children, Nikita and Elizabeth. Alex. First of all, a little, a little bit of history of migraine headaches. Uh, migraine is a truly ancient disorder. The first mentioning of migraine headaches goes all the way down to, oops, sorry, down to 6,000 years ago. The first description of that actually given by Hippocrates, and the first more or less classification was provided in the first century AD by Arethus of Cappadocia. And back then we used to call, or they used to call, I should say, Migrant encephalology, encephalia, Peter Crania, pretty much describing that the pain uh, in patients with migraines is uh, special. It's located or involves only the half uh, of the head, and that's where the encephalia or Peter Crania is coming from. Also, back then, first century of AD, uh, first uh, visual war presentations were actually described in the literature. Uh, eventually, our knowledge about migraines grew stronger, and the first pathophysiological details were um, described or proposed by Galen in the 2nd century AD. And back then, even back then, uh, people started making connections between the brain and the abdomen. And uh, there used to be a thought process going on that there was an anatomical connection actually between the brain and the abdomen, considering the symptoms of migraines, such as throbbing, headache, and nausea, and vomiting associated with it. Uh, eventually, considering again the quality of the pain as, as, pain, as pain being throbbing or stabbing, uh, the hypothesis came out that it was that there's some blood vascular involvement uh, in the central nervous system. And then eventually the term hemicrania was transformed, changed, and eventually came up to the germination uh, of the cynic as the migraine of pain. Uh, first, more or less, um, I guess medical and the scientific theory of migraine pathogenesis was developed by Thomas Phillips in the 17th century, and that theory evolved later on um, into more uh, detailed uh, neurovascular theory uh, that we know today. Also, back then in the 17th century, there were the first expressions of use of coffee or caffeine containing products in migraine treatment. A little bit more about the epidemiology. So first of all, migraines, we need to know that this is one of the most common, one of the most frequent headache disorders, or the second, the, the most common is the obvious attention type headache, but the migraines is really a close second. If you look at the prevalence or the distribution of the migraine headache disorder among patients and among population, it's about 18% of all females uh, are affected by migraines, 5% of all males. And another important thing about this is the highest prevalence, take a look at these numbers here, which years 
uh, our usual effect is really 25, uh, 55 years of age, so the most productive years were affected by migraines. And as we probably well know, that the female to male ratio of 3 to 1, so it's much more common among females than in male. And coming <coughs> from this, that from the overall prevalence of the migraines, coming from the years that our migraines usually occur within 25 or 55 years in the most productive uh, age, that's where the economical impact is coming from. Cost in the United States alone is about $1 billion per year for uh, care of migra uh, migraine uh, or for migraine therapy, pretty much migraine treatment. And loss of productivity uh, costs in the is 13 to 17 billion dollars each year. So it's quite a devastating uh, disorder. Uh, this is the uh, most recent classification of the migraine headaches. Uh, I, I'm just throwing this slide in so that you, you'll see that uh, the classification is quite actually extensive and it's quite complicated. There are a variety of migraine disorders, migraine types, or subtypes, there are migraine midor, migraine without, or a chronic migraine, there are, there are a few cases of complicated migraine, improbable migraine, and so on and so forth. Uh, now a little bit of the pathophysiology. So first of all, back in the beginning of the 19th or 20th century, there was a first uh, more or less popular and the most, I guess, scientifically proven theory was the vascular theory, when we knew that the basic constriction in the central nervous system, particularly in the brain, is caused by the visual aura. And uh, as it uh, is a uh, compensatory mechanism of the central nervous system to compensate for this basic constriction, the brain sends a signal to dilate the blood vessels to increase the blood flow to the uh, uh, previously deprived of blood uh, areas of the central nervous system, causing this increased throbbing intense pain. Um, we also, I think it's important to, in, in order to understand the pathophysiology of migrants uh, better, we need to understand also the innervation of the uh, central nervous system, the innervation of the blood vessels and the uh, meningeal layers of the brain. And two main components of this innervation is really coming down to the intracranial <coughs> nerve, the trigeminal ganglion, uh, or trigeminal nerve, or gasserian nerve, and then also the cervical spine is also involved, because particular of C1 and C2 nerve roots, it's a proximal cervical spine nerve, nerve roots, and they provide pretty much innervation of both of the structures, provide innervation of the uh, uh, inner layers of the uh, cranium, the uh, brain meningeal layers, as well as the skin and the uh, face. Uh, it's also important to know that the stimulation, and uh, that was shown in multiple uh, research projects and multiple studies, the stimulation of the cranial nerve leads to release of so-called substance P and the calcitonin gene-related peptides and a few other uh, neurochemicals, which we now call as the uh, neurogenic pro-inflammatory peptides. Those uh, peptides pretty much lead to the inflammation or uh, uh, increased sensitivity of the nervous system to painful stimulation, kind of promoting and producing uh, uh, pain in migraine headaches as well. So and this is just a graphic presentation of those two six, uh, systems. The main one, obviously, is the trigeminal uh, nerve, which is the, the here's the trigeminal ganglion that has three main branches, and there's the blood vessels. And uh, we used to think that the migraines were purely vascular headache disorder, but in recent years, since we learn more about the migraine development and their pathogenesis, now we know it's actually neurovascular, and that there's a very close connection between the trigeminal nerve, between the nervous system, brain and uh, the blood vessels in the brain. Now how does this work in a kind of international way? So why do people get migraines? And uh, if uh, you will, we can just put it in a very, very simplistic uh, graphics here. Uh, here's the re representation of the trigeminal uh, nervous system. There's a blood vessel here. And whenever there's a trigger, and again, as a trigger, uh, whoever's migraines, they have a variety of triggers. It could be stress, it could be dietary, lack of sleep, could be certain foods, uh, red wine, cheese, uh, multiple basic triggers. So whatever trigger comes, it's very non-specific. It stimulates and triggers something within the trigeminal nervous system. And this stimulation then goes along producing those uh, pro-inflammatory uh, neurogenic peptide that causes the vasodilation initially, and that leads to the sterile neurogenic inflammation. And what is sterile neurogenic inflammation? It's basically, when the blood vessels dilate, the plasma of the liquid part of the, of the blood starts squeezing and extravasating or traveling from the inside of the blood vessel <coughs> to the outside of the blood vessel, creating sort of like a swelling and edema around the blood vessels. And that continues to stimulate by creating extra pressure, if you will, of the peripheral branches of the trigeminal nerve, 
thus completing this vicious cycle. So the more irritation or stimulation of the trigeminal nerve leads again to further production of the neurogenic peptides and the vicious cycle continues and uh, that's how my develops and patients start having uh, more and more nausea and vomiting and uh, more and uh, more intense uh, and severe pain. Uh, what are the diagnostic criteria and when should we, um, overall if there are more than 15 types of actually primary headache disorders, migraine is just one of them, so who should we consider as a migraineer? What are the diagnostic criteria? And if you look at this, uh, first of all, patient needs to have at least history of five attacks that fulfill this criteria. First of all, the headache attack should last between 4 and 72 hours, that's the most common representation. Uh, do we see patients who don't fall in certain of those criteria? Of course, pediatric patients, for example, they may have uh, migraines that does not last nearly as long, they last one or two hours at the most. Uh, sometimes we see adult, adult patients in whom migraines may last much longer than 72 hours, and then it's risk of the status of migraine in that case. So this is kind of more or less textbook style, traditional presentation of migraine. Plus, in addition to having this severe pain that lasts 4 to 72, between 4 and 72 hours, Patients uh, need to have at least uh, two of the following characteristics. That means that the characteristics of the pain mainly. The pain should be predominantly unilateral in location. And another important thing is that um, the pain should not, not only be affecting one side of a uh, patient's head or brain, but actually should switch side once in a while. And the migraine is a very important uh, clinical uh, feature for the migraine headache that may distinguish that from other headache disorders as well. Uh, the pain usually naturally tends to have throbbing or stabbing character. Uh, the intensity of the pain is usually severe or moderate, but the majority of the patients will probably say that the migraines are, tend to be rather severe and moderate. And uh, another important thing is um, that pretty much any kind of routine activity may aggravate the pre-existing pain. So patients tend to, there, there used to be uh, a comparison of patients with migraine, they carry their head at the base, the crystal base. They don't want any movement, they don't want any noise. Uh, pretty much no motion around them that would make them feel somewhat better. Also, patients with migraines during this uh, severe migraine attack should experience at least one of those either nausea or vomiting or sensitivity to light and noise. And obviously, all of the symptoms should not be attributed to any other any disorders or trauma or injury or anything like this. Uh, clinical presentation. This is just an example of uh, one of the patients that uh, we saw in the clinic, but I'm almost certain that it could, uh, this patient would be seen in any uh, in uh, MD's office. So we saw a 24 year old female uh, who was complaining of recurrent severe throbbing headache located usually on one side of the head. Um, she says the duration of the headache varies, but usually it lasts about 24 hours, and again, that's the most common presentation we see in, uh, in our practice. Uh, the headache is almost always associated with nausea, occasionally vomiting. Usually, this uh, feature is really the intensity of the pain related. The more intense the pain, the more the highlight for the vomiting. Uh, in the clinical presentation. And then they also show to reported sensitivity to light and noise to the extent that she prefers to stay in a dark white room. And again, this is a very classical presentation uh, and uh, behavior pattern of patients with migraine. She also said that she, during the severe headache attack, she's not able to function and maintain her daily routine activities. Again, this is uh, going down to the same feature that the patients with any kind of routine daily activity may aggravate the pain or incapacitate the patient in that sense. She also notices, uh, this is something interesting, uh, she also notices that uh, she has an increased fatigue level of yawning, irritability, food craving within a day or two prior to the headache on the so-called prodrome phase. And a lot of patients notice it, it doesn't occur every single time, but many patients notice that. that you know, it's not the aura necessarily, it's really uh, something that occurs a uh, day or two, sometimes a week before the onset of the migraine, when the patients start feeling some, some of those symptoms uh, that I just mentioned here and then we progress and eventually evolve into an actual headache. She also stated that occasionally she may see flashing lights or develop some facial numbness uh, that usually lasts for a few minutes and then disappear. And that, these symptoms usually are followed by severe throbbing pain located in one of her temples. Uh, she also told us that her mother has never, uh, has never had actual migraines or she's never been diagnosed with migraines and, uh, but she always suffered from so-called sinus headache <laughs> Again, most of the time, probably 90% of the time, when patients are saying that they've been diagnosed with sinus headache or suffered from sinus headache, usually they're talking about really migraine headache. It's probably the most common misdiagnosis for, for migraine headache disorder. 
and the theoretical physical and neurological examination was essentially not remarkable. So that was a really classical, uh, I guess, textbook style presentation of an uncomplicated uh, mind and thing. Now, those flashing lights and numbness that the patient was developed, this is uh, sometimes a very disturbing symptom for a lot of patients with migraines, especially those who are new to the migraine, who started recently or who recently started having migraines, and who have diagnosed with one. When they started having headaches, and then they start seeing flashing lights, or develop double vision, or develop numbness, or tingling sensation in their arm, or their face, either on one side or the other. There's always concern whether there's this, whether there's a stroke, whether there's a tumor, or something else going on that definitely the migraine is well enough the primary source of all the discomfort. So most of the time, again, if we're talking about the migraines and complicated primary headache disorder, we're talking about the aura. So what is migraine aura? A migraine aura, first of all, is a very common uh, condition, and there are different types of aura. Here I'm just describing mainly the, uh, in, in this part, it's mainly what's used to be called classical migraine, <coughs> visual migraine, how we uh, call it now. It's a focal, short-lasting, and fully reversible neurological defects. So meaning that, uh, it should last only within an hour by definition. It should, last, uh, it should never last more than 60 minutes. And by the end of this time frame, this neurological symptom should come up with the result. Uh, the most common type of aura, as I mentioned earlier, is a visual aura. Uh, it's usually called, again, as a classical migraine. That's where they start seeing flashing lights, or they have some patients to report cutouts in their visual fields, or black dots that obliterate uh, their visual fields. And sometimes it could be quite disturbing. And then just this uh, past week, I saw the patient who have multiple blind dots to the point that she cannot drive or read anything. It's that severe. And then the symptoms that can last usually from five minutes to 60 minutes and then disappear. <clears throat> Most of the time, the aura occurs right before the onset of the headache, and usually it's, uh, about 30 to 60 minutes before the onset of the headache phase, and rarely it may occur during the headaches or even follow the headache. Uh, and here, just from the uh, educational standpoint, I uh, decided to put a couple of other uh, presentations uh, for a couple of other types of migraine. The first one is hemiplegic migraine. This is part of the complicated migraine syndrome when patients develop actually true weaknesses, more like a stroke like symptoms, which again usually uh, are short lived you know, within an hour, but there are cases described when the hemiplegic migraine may last much longer, the symptom neurological deficit may last much, much longer with normal imaging, normal MRI, so it's not really strong. And then the result completely without leaving any residual uh, deficit. And uh, another uh, type of course, vestibular type, uh, migraine vestibular type, where when patients experience severe dizziness or vertigo, I should say, when actually they uh, report uh, spinning sensation at the onset of the headache, that again may last from 30 to 40 minutes, or up to an hour, they develop the tingling and numbness, just like in a classical uh, visual work, but it also, but it would involve in this case both sides of their body, so right, right and left simultaneously, and that's a very important key component, uh, component in addition to the vertigo. And we also report double vision and a couple of other features that usually present on both sides of, the, of, of their body. And this is just a few visual examples. Well, I'm from Moscow, so you probably recognize this thing. <laughs> Uh, this is this is just a normal, uh, beautiful picture. And just a presentation for migraines would be something like a zigzag line here. It's called the, certi uh, the certification spectrum. It's a classical presentation as well. It's well described in uh, many uh, uh, books and uh, overall in migraine literature. There could be uh, positive scotomas when you see the flashing lights and uh, they can kind of obliterate the site. And again, it could be either multiple small spots or it could be one large spot that obliterates uh, the visual field. It could be one single negative symptom when there's a cutout in the visual field when it's not substituted, but rather just really empty. And uh, finally, this is going back to the normal image, it would be just image distortion like this, if you can see it here. It's fairly similar, but also quite disturbing uh, to patients with the mind and all this. Now, what else should we consider when we diagnose patients with a migraine? Which are the factors in here? First of all, as I mentioned earlier, the family history. And, and just like we, uh, just like I mentioned in my previous uh, case presentation, patients uh, mother and early diagnosed with migraines, but this the uh, frequent uh, constant uh, side effects. Again, usually we need to question whether it was just a specific migraine that was diagnosed at some point. So the family history is a big part of the uh, uh, migraine phase. Uh, roughly, if you want to say what's the, what's the prevalence or what's the importance of the um, genetic predisposition is uh, probably would be it's probably would be easier to put it in this way that if the mother of a child has migraines, the child has a, a 
about 50 or 25 percent rate sometimes of having 25 percent chance of having a migraine with both father and mothers could be up to 50 or 75 percent. So the, the genetical predisposition is uh, enormous in the patients with migraines. Then age and gender. Again, it's more uh, common affects female, about 3 to 1 ratio to males. Uh, usually, this is a disorder of a young, uh, productive uh, people. It frequently starts in childhood, and then actually in uh, boys, the uh, migraines tend to disappear by the adolescent years, while in girls, actually, the frequency starts, uh, may, may actually increase uh, and continue to progress. Uh, but usually, again, it's affected about 25 to 55 uh, years of age in that kind of uh, productive population. Mm -hmm. The activity status, again, I've mentioned, a little bit repeating myself here again, how patients behave during a migraine attack. For example, a patient with the tension tachytic, which, uh, which occasionally may be severe and uh, quite disabling as well, but actual patients with tension tachytic, they find relief in maintaining some sort of routine activity. They can go and exercise, they can go for a walk, and by doing so, they feel better. While migraineurs actually would prefer well, to stay still, to be in a dark, quiet room without any noise or light coming in. Another important thing that helps us to make a diagnosis is presence of particular triggers. Uh, there are certain uh, headache disorders that are famous and notorious to have certain triggers, and migraine is one of them. When there's hormonal changes, uh, menstrual associated changes, uh, or ovulation pregnancy associated changes with migraines, uh, there are dietary uh, triggers, uh, weather changes, stress related changes that may trigger migraines. So, the presence of those also improves the likelihood of this person having a migraine. And finally, response to the medication, which is not necessarily the best, probably, diagnostic tool, but this is, if you look at this as a big puzzle, this probably will be one of those small pieces that you may add if patients respond to certain type of medications. It also may help uh, us in diagnosing um, uh, a migraine headache. What else is important? First of all, besides just having a classical clinical presentation, we need to have a very thorough neurological examination. I'll show you in a second why. Um, I do believe that there's a need for baseline imaging, meaning that for the imaging uh, that, for example, if we see a patient with a migraine headache that was either was diagnosed or never been diagnosed with migraines before, but never had imaging before, now, regardless of the age, probably imaging should be done at baseline. Uh, why, why is this where this coming from? Well, first of all, they're, they're, they're brain tumors, okay, just to, to start with that. Is it common? No, it's not really that common. About 90% of all headaches are primary or benign headache disorders, so migraines, tension headaches, cluster headaches, and so on and so forth. Only 5% of all headache disorders are attributed to secondary causes, which could be tumors. 20% of patients with tumors from that again, they present um, with, the, with the headache being their initial symptom. And 60% will develop headaches as the tumor progresses. And then 82% of patients will notice some change in the headache pattern. Now, how does it... Um, come into play uh, when we talk about the clinical practical uh, knowledge. This is another actual case that I saw here in Chicago during my residency years at St. John's Hospital that we, we admitted a 44 year old female. She didn't have really any past medical history. She was fairly healthy, no major issues. And then, and then she presents basically with a history of two year history of severe headache. She described the headache as being uh, initial episodic but progressively worsening, which is again very common migrant presentation. Uh, it was severe, it was unilateral or bilateral, so meaning affecting one or both sides of the head. Yeah, and it was the throbbing pain associated with nausea, vomiting, photo and phonophobia, the sense of delight and noise. So if I was still here, what diagnosis was going to make? Most likely migraine. And that was actually that was her primary care physician did the diagnosis with her migraine, started from prophylactic medications, uh, good uh, rescue medications, and she was doing well for a while. And then um, uh, eventually, she was diagnosed with migraine without aura six months ago by her primary care physician. She was treated with all of these medications. And eventually, she developed an episode of severe throbbing headache, was intractable vomiting, and uh, she was diagnosed with a status migraine, was sent to the hospital where I was a resident, who admitted her for rehydration, started her on intravenous fluids management, and she was doing somewhat better. And then we realized that she'd never had any imaging done. And, uh, they, Key or red flag in this whole history, number one, was that she was 44 years old and she started having headaches just two years ago, so it's 42. Is it usual, uh, typical presentation for migraines? Usually not. It, it happens, but it's not very, very characteristic. Then we see this change in the headache pattern eventually, her headaches all of a sudden. So that was another red flag if we wanted to investigate any further. The patients never had any uh, imaging done before, once again. So we did an MRI of the brain that was ordered uh, at the hospital. Here's the picture. And you can see here a large, this is the brain if you look from the bottom up. 
This is the front, this is the back of the head, and you see there's a large, it's about fifth size. Here's the dimension on the lateral view, 61.6 millimeters in size tumor. Uh, to add to this, it's uh, located uh, in, um, I believe it was in the right uh, uh, frontal lobe. So the lobe that is responsible basically for our motor you know, function, for our motor function, sensory function. Not only she did not have a neurological deficit, she was actually working as the English language teacher in uh, college, or I'm sorry, in high school, and never had any problems other than just the headaches. Neurological, she was absolutely preserved. Her neurological examination was absolutely normal. So she eventually underwent the craniotomy and the was the benign angioma that was removed, and she actually did doing quite well in this case. But this is just one of those examples why baseline imaging probably should be done. Now, very briefly about the uh, treatment of migraines. Uh, when we talk about the migraine case, uh, I want, I'd like you to divide all the treatment uh, uh, modalities into two categories. The rescue medication is something that we'll use to treat the ongoing migraine to receive an immediate pain relief. And this is something that we would usually use and probably stop there for migraines or for patients' episodic migraines. Uh, episodic means the patient may have two or three migraines per month. They, they really don't need any prophylactic medication at this point. All they will really, really be talking about is just the rescue medication. Once they have a migraine with medication, it's fine and they continue to function. And there are a variety of the medications. There are about the pain medication, though there's the most specific anti-migraine medication. That was the first one that was designed in 1920, what was discovered in 1928. Um, uh, in, the, in the early 90s, their second family of the medication came about as a treatment family. This is probably the most popular uh, uh, type of rescue medication in these days. They're extremely effective. There are seven or eight treatments on the market right now. All of them are equally effective. Uh, they have different onset of action, as I'll show you uh, in a second. Uh, they have different um, route of uh, administration. Most of them are oral forms. There are some injectable medication. There are medications in the form of the nasal sprays and so on. And the half of the medication matters, the onset of action matters as well. And to me, I think those two parameters are probably the most important part. As a rule, when we treat migraine headaches, we treat, we need to treat or we at least need to instruct the patients to treat the migraines as early as they can. If they have a visual order, for example, at the onset of the migraine, that probably should be the starting point for the treatment of migraine. That's when they should really start taking the uh, rescue medications. If they miss that what we call a therapeutic opportunity, therapeutic window, and they start taking the medications when the migraines are already full blown developed. Uh, they're intense and disabling. At this point, the success of the therapy is not going to be as great. And all of these parameters from this uh, onset of action, duration of action also uh, would matter depending on what kind of migraine the patient has and the fast developing migraines and prolonged migraine last usual three or four days, and that would uh, matter in terms of which treatment the uh, physician is going to choose. Uh, there are some kind of medications, although the triptans are very popular medication, they are very effective, and they, in general they are safe medication. There are some kind of medications, such as the uncontrolled high blood, uh, high blood pressure, and those patients probably uh, triptans should not be used, or not until the blood pressure is well managed and well controlled. If there is a severe liver or kidney damage, uh, this medication should be avoided. Interestingly enough, patients with those basilar migraine, hemiplegic migraine that I mentioned earlier, with neurological symptoms in their presentation, those complicated migraine cases, should not be used for dense at this point. And there, are, there are differences of opinion at this, at this point regarding whether we can or cannot treat patients with those complicated words. Patients with coronary artery disease, patients who use MAO inhibitors, certain type of uh, treatment should not be used and should actually avoid it. And also, as a general rule, this medication should be avoided during the pregnancy. Uh, prophylactic, well, um, a couple of other acute treatment options is basically something that uh, uh, you may want to use in patients who are admitted to the hospital with status migraines and tractable migraines. Those are the intravenous uh, type of medications. Some of them could be used in the emergency department setting as well with great success. Prophylactic therapy, we have a variety of the medications available today, and uh, really the order how we should start with which medication we should start. It really depends on the clinical presentation, on the comorbidities in every single patient, whether they have an asthma or high blood pressure, uh, or any other, or depression or comor comorbid anxiety, for example. That all will matter in terms of which prophylactic medication we should start a patient with. And there's a beta blocker, which is a blood pressure medication, or a calcium channel block, or another blood pressure medication, or anti-arrhythmic. Uh, there are anti-convulsants, and we have several of them, all of which were uh, Approved, uh, such as valproic acid, or depakote, and, uh, and the pyramid of 
uh, and find out their antidepressants, maybe for excitement antidepressants. So there's some uh, success with the selective uh, serotonin <coughs> with norepinephrine reptate inhibitors, and finally, uh, MAOI inhibitors as well. Important uh, thing that everybody, I think, who take the prophylactic medication or prescribe prophylactic medication <coughs> is to know that uh, there is a delayed response. This medication takes usually four to six weeks to become effective. And we see it literally every day in the office when patients come and they say that they've tried all of these medications in the past and nothing has helped. The patient they're frustrated. When we start asking questions about the details of this therapy, very frequently we say that they haven't been taking this medication for such a long period of time, maybe a couple of weeks, a couple of days sometimes and simply did not feel the relief, the medication was discontinued, which was, in my opinion, incorrect. And uh, so all of this medication should be provided as an adequate uh, therapeutic trial. There are some interventional uh, approaches now uh, that we use sometimes for treatment of migraines. There's a, this one is the Botox therapy, uh, which was also FDA approved about two and a half years ago, and we've had uh, quite success with actually with the uh, treatment of uh, chronic migraines a bit, uh, basically, not uh, episodic migraines point. <laughs> and uh, again, usually uh, very well tolerated therapy, very quick acting, and uh, quite effective in general. Another important thing is the non-medication treatment of migraine headaches, which is probably just as important, and I tell to all of my patients that this, the lifestyle modification, non-pharmacological interventions are just as important, if not more important, than the medical treatment. Patients need to be aware of the diet, uh, uh, so-called the low tyrone diet is supposed to, or in other names, an anti-migraine diet. Uh, tyrone is one of those chemical substances naturally occurring in certain foods and products that may trigger migraines, and those products should be avoided. Uh, patients will also recommend patients to maintain regular meals, to maintain regular sleep pattern. Uh, we recommend using the biofeedback for stress management, for relaxation. And all of this uh, uh, aspect should be definitely implemented in every single patient, regardless whether it's a chronic migraine or a chronic migraine. And uh, final, this is my final slide. Um, migraineurs, you're in a good company. Uh, when I was back in, back in Russia, uh, the uh, professor who taught me initial uh, you know, aspects, the basics of the migraine neurology, he paid a lot of attention to personality of patients with migraines. And uh, he believed that migraineurs are uh, usually very early oriented, they're very successful people in life. And this is just uh, a quick example. This is a uh, short quiz for, for all of you, if you can recognize the, and just say it out loud. Oh, uh, let's see, that's right. How about this one? It's a famous uh, artist. Tell your name. It's an old famous people. How about this one? Caesar, exactly. And this one? Right. And last but not the least? Thank you so much. And I don't know if we do questions now or.